I work at the Department of Defense, so I have to say that my remarks are my own views, not those of the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, the National Defense University, even though they ought to all be listening to me more. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the role of military and security issues in U.S.-China relations. Uh, and I'm going to try to give a kind of broader overview uh, of some of these issues. And so I think you start with the broad take of the U.S.-China relationship, which is, it's complicated. It's a mix of cooperation and competition, depending on whether U.S. and Chinese interests overlap or whether they diverge. And I think in the military and security sphere, the competitive aspects are a lot more evident, especially when we talk about the Asia-Pacific. Actually, when you go outside Asia, there's a lot more scope for military and security cooperation. But within the region, it's much more competitive. And I think you have to think about this from a policy perspective. There's two questions about priorities. The first is about the relative importance of Asia related to other parts of the world. And the second is the relative importance of military and security issues with respect to other US national interests, many of which require cooperation with China if we're going to make progress on them. Uh, so that's a perspective to kind of keep in mind as we go forward. Um, and so let me start with uh, the question of the regional piece. And I'll start with the US rebalance to Asia, of which you've heard much. And this is because the Obama administration came into office thinking we were devoting too much attention, resources, military, and otherwise to the Middle East. And we were missing opportunities in Asia. And we were missing and not dealing adequately with challenges in Asia. So I think that's the underlying logic of the rebalance is Asia is really, really important and we aren't devoting enough attention to it. And I think that was evident from the beginning of the administration, even though the rebalance wasn't formally announced till November 2011. Um, what's really going on in Asia is China's growth is really transforming the region. And that happens in a variety of ways. Uh, obviously, the economic growth is reshaping economic patterns. But that's producing new instruments for diplomatic power. And it's, it's funding a Chinese military modernization that's really changing Chinese capabilities in a fundamental way. So for the first time, you have a real Chinese Navy that's capable of projecting power within the South China Sea, within the East China Sea, uh, and even beyond that into the Indian Ocean. Uh, and that's a fundamental change within Asia. And in many ways is the driver for a lot of the politics, at least certainly on security and military issues. And for the United States, that challenges what we see as a post-World War II era where the US has had unquestioned military dominance, at least in maritime Asia. And now Chinese capabilities are starting to challenge that. And so there is this sense of rivalry within the region, both on political, diplomatic, but especially on military issues. Uh, and that's evident when you talk to Chinese. It's evident when you talk to uh, Americans about this. Incidentally, I'm involved in a joint US-China research project. And the most interesting aspect of that, we're writing parallel papers. But to see the Chinese military analysis of the situation in Asia and many of the issues I'm going to talk about very much parallels the US analysis. So we sort of see a lot of things the same way, even if we feel differently about them. The second issue I want to talk about, um, which is a change partly driven by Chinese increasing power, is the role that the United States and China play in each other's force modernization. And I think this is a big change from 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, the PLA was trying to start to become a modern military, and look what that took. You know, the US looked at China, and it didn't justify any of the systems that the US military wanted to purchase. Well, 20 years on, it's very different. One of the seeds of that was the 1995-1996 Taiwan uh, Strait crisis, which was referred to. Uh, the US sent two carriers to waters near Taiwan. And from that point on, the Chinese military said, we didn't, don't have the capabilities in 1995-96 to deal with it. That's going to be our number one contingency for modernizing our military, military to be capable of dealing with Taiwan. And if we're going to be capable of dealing with Taiwan, that means we have to be capable of dealing with the United States. And so that's been a big driver for China's modernization. And it's produced investments in new systems that challenge US dominance in a lot of ways. So we could talk about attack submarines. We could talk about precision strike in terms of cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. Uh, we could talk about advanced destroyers and surface-to-air missiles. Some of these systems are purpose-built. 
you have an innovation from China, an anti-ship ballistic missile, which is designed to target aircraft carriers. And they're not worried about the Thai aircraft carrier. That's pretty specifically targeted against the United States. So that's been a big change, and it pushes in a more competitive direction because the U.S. sees this happening. We hear China say this is not aimed at any particular country, but we can do the math and see who it seems to be aimed at. And now China has become a driver for U.S. military modernization and doctrinal innovation. So air-sea battle, the joint, uh, joint access concept, this is a response to not just China's capabilities, but these types of capabilities that challenge the U.S. ability to operate. And now you see things like the Air Force buying a new strategic bomber. Well, China is a big part of the justification for why the Air Force needs this. So that's a big change, that it's a more interactive, conventional security environment, both militaries looking at what the other is, is buying and how they're thinking about using it and how do we need to respond. And that's a more competitive environment within that conventional domain. Another area I'd like to talk about briefly, but Mary Beth is gonna talk about it more, is the strategic domains of nuclear space and cyber. Uh, and I'll chat a little bit about nuclear modernization. And one of the, Ch China has had a policy of no nuclear no first use. It's been satisfied with a relatively small nuclear force. And it's become less satisfied with that, partly as the U.S. invested in ballistic missile defenses. And those were mainly driven by the perception of North Korean and Iranian missile threats, uh, but they have an impact on China's nuclear deterrence. So China, seeing the U.S. deploy this, started to modernize its force. It went to a more survivable force of ground-based mobile missiles, and now this year is starting to deploy its first real nuclear submarine deterrent force. Um, and that's a different set of operational capabilities. It's a greater number. In one respect, that makes the Chinese nuclear arsenal more survivable. But it's also already part of the U.S. debate. And if you take a look at the debate transcript, you'll see a little bit about this. A lot of the U.S. Nu nuclear arsenal is 40 or 50 years old. And so we are investing to modernize that, to build newer, uh, newer systems that are, that are uh, more capable and less old. And China, again, is part of that debate. So you see on the nuclear side an increasing interaction. That's been a marginal part of the U.S.-China strategic relationship. Now it's becoming a more important part and a somewhat more competitive one. With respect to space and cyber, I just want to make the point that if you read Chinese military writings and strategic documents and U.S. military writings and strategic documents, you could swap them around. I mean, both of our strategic analysts see space and cyber as critical for enabling military operations. You've got to be able to use those domains if you want to fight an effective modern war. And so the military writings say, so we've got to be able to do this. We have to have assured access to those domains. And we have to be able to deny our adversaries access to that. And it's a competitive strategic environment. And that's the commanding heights in strategy. And you've got to be able to compete and win there. Um, so I think U.S. and Chinese strategists see this in similar ways and in very competitive ways. Another issue I wanted to touch on briefly is U.S. relations with its allies and partners. It's our bases, it's our relationships with allies and partners that really enable U.S. forward military presence, which we felt underpins stability in the Asia-Pacific region for some time. Now with that comes security commitments to allies such as Japan and South Korea, including the extension of the U.S. nuclear umbrella to cover them if they are threatened by attack. And as our allies look at a China that's becoming more powerful, that's building its military capabilities, and that has become somewhat more willing to use them in coercive ways, they're looking to the U.S. Uh, for greater assurance. Now, China's not the only driver there. I think North Korea, particularly as they have repeatedly tested nuclear weapons, have developed longer range missiles and probably have the ability to put the two of those things together. If they don't have it, they will shortly. That's an additional threat seen here. But for U.S. allies, they're looking for the U.S. to reassure them that the U.S. is going to remain engaged, that we can effectively deter those threats. Um, and that's a, that's a demand that we are responding to. And I think, again, partly this interaction between the U.S. and China that's caused a shift in Chinese views of the alliance. The, the attitude has been sort of reluctant tolerance that, well, 
okay, the alliance is if you're keeping the cork in the bottle with respect to Japan, if you're keeping Japan and South Korea from going nuclear, we may not like them, but it's probably a force for stability. But I think increasingly the attitude is, well, you're empowering those countries. You're empowering a Japan that wants to be a normal country that is building military capabilities. And that's not restraining them anymore. That's enabling them. And that's something that's not good for China. So I think we've seen a shift in that attitude, uh, both in informal and more formal statements, talking about US alliances as relics of the Cold War and not a part of the security architecture in, of the future. Whereas the United States sees those as the foundation for security and stability in the region and a building block upon which you can do other things. So again, a more competitive uh, environment in that area. One of the areas that has received a lot of attention, and I heard talk during the break about it, and it was on the previous panel, is the issue of maritime disputes in Asia. And really what we're talking here is the South China Sea and the East China Sea. South China Sea, where the Spratly Islands are claimed by six different entities. East China Sea, especially there's a disputed maritime border between China and Japan. And then northeast of Taiwan, there's the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands claimed by China, Taiwan, and <coughs> Japan. So that's really what we are talking about. Um, and this is an increasingly competitive area. It, it had been on the back burner for a number of years, uh, partly because of a Chinese restrained policy. Ironically, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, which required countries to specify what precisely they're claiming and what does this mean, um, in 2009, that fostered a bunch of activity by all the claimants to specify more precisely what it was that they claimed. And I think that started to turn the heat back on on these issues. Um, and I think there's also been a shift in China as it has become more powerful. It's felt it has more of an ability to do things to influence these issues. And it seems to be the case for Xi Jinping personally that he cares more about them perhaps than Hu Jintao did, or certainly is willing to to do more and bear more costs and risks from that. Uh, so what we have seen in recent years uh, is an increase in Chinese capabilities, naval capabilities, Coast Guard capabilities, Air Force capabilities, and an increase in activity within the South China Sea and the East China Sea. So in 2012, you had the Scarborough Shoal incident, a Philippine naval vessel arrested Chinese fishermen for illegal fishing. The Chinese Coast Guard and Navy came in. There was a confrontation. The US brokered a withdrawal. And then the Chinese came back with Coast Guard ships and have maintained a presence there ever since. Uh, that's, that's a different kind of activity from China. You have uh, China, Japan's purchase of some of the Senkaku Islands. China decided that was a change in the status quo and started challenging Japanese control over those islands with repeated uh, naval and coast guard and air patrols in the areas around that. And the declaration of an air defense identification zone. That's a different kind of behavior. In 2014, we saw China take the, uh, the oil rig out into waters uh, that Vietnam claims and do drilling there, a coordinated operation by Sinook with the oil rig, the Chinese coast guard, and the Chinese Navy all working together. That's a little bit different. In 2015, we saw Chinese construction of artificial islands on a number of reefs and submerged features, did land reclamation, and then went on to build ports and airfields on that. That greatly improves China's ability to project power within the region. So this is, in my view, a change in Chinese behavior from a more passive approach to a, a passive or reactive approach to a more proactive one where China's not reacting to things that other countries are doing. It's taking actions on its own. And this challenges US policy toward the region. Our policy for a long time, and for good reasons, has been we don't take sides into territorial disputes that we are not a party to. Uh, why get involved? You're only going to make somebody mad. We don't care so much about the outcome, but what we do care about is how those, those issues are, are pursued. And we want them to be pursued peacefully, without coercion, and in accordance with international law. Um, consequence of that is the US policy has been somewhat passive. Even as China and the other claimants have stepped up their activities, uh, it doesn't necessarily directly affect US interests, but it does have a negative effect within the region. And our interests in the region are freedom of navigation and respect for international law. And in some, some of the ways 
that China has specified or not specified its claims and some of the ways it has pursued those claims uh, are a challenge to international law. And so we have responded both with an increased presence of our own, but also using Freedom of Navigation Acts to challenge claims that we regard as illegitimate or not founded under international law. Uh, the, one, the actions we've taken with respect to China's claims have gotten a lot of attention, but it's worth pointing out here this is a global policy. The U.S. does this sometimes with Canada, and the Canadians don't like it uh, very much at all. Um, but that's the context. And this brings us to the Philippine decision to take China to court under the UNCLOS, to take them to the arbitration tribunal, and to argue that many of China's claims uh, are unfounded, don't have a basis under UNCLOS, or violate various aspects of, Philippines, of the Philippines' rights. And China chose uh, to argue that the tribunal had no jurisdiction over this, uh, although I think most U.S. lawyers would say that's a pretty clear case that when you sign UNCLOS, you're accepting that jurisdiction. And once the ruling came out in a way that was very unfavorable to China, it announced that it would ignore the results from that. So from a U.S. perspective, this is a blow to international law, uh, even though it undermines some of the Chinese claims. And it's worth noting as well that the precedent set by this ruling, which had a new definition for what an island is, or a more precise definition, um, potentially could apply to the United States and some of its claims in other areas, uh, and certainly does apply to Japanese claims with Okina Tori. Um, so this is an area where there's been a lot of tension. It's widely seen as a more competitive aspect, uh, and again, um, I think both U.S. and Chinese analysts would say that. Where I want to wind up is, is talking a little bit about military to military relations. So I've described a relationship in all of these areas that's becoming more competitive. There are areas of cooperation, but I will leave that for the question and answer session since I don't have a lot of time. Um, but what's kind of remarkable is in the midst of this increasing sense of competition, there's been a sustained increase in military to military interactions. And by that, we mean everything from high level visits, the Secretary of Defense uh, traveling to China, Chinese senior military leaders traveling to the United States. Sometimes we host them at, at NDU for speeches. Uh, but not just that, exercises, functional exchanges, uh, Chinese students from their NDU visiting the United States and US students going there, a range of dialogues on a range of issues. Despite this increase in competition, an increase in mill-to-mill -mill activity. So how do we explain that? Um, well, I think it doesn't correlate with increased strategic trust. That's not what's going on here. It's an effort to recognize that these are areas where there's competition, but we need to manage that competition in ways that doesn't blow up the whole relationship. And there's been guidance from the civilian leaders in both Washington and in Beijing to the militaries that you need to work this relationship harder, you need to develop confidence building measures and crisis management mechanisms to deal with this competition. And I think there's actually been some significant progress in this. Uh, in one respect, the mill-to-mill -mill part, which used to be every time one side did something the other didn't like, they would take it out on military exchanges and stop them. It's been more sustained over the, uh, since 2011, so it hasn't been as susceptible to interruption. And there's been an effort to develop some of these communications and crisis management mechanisms. So we have hotlines, we have a secure video teleconference system, uh, we have negotiated some confidence building measures, we have an MOU specifying the rules of air and maritime interaction. And I think the hope is that this will both provide ways to avoid some accidents and incidents and provide some of the tools to better manage them uh, when they do occur. And that's part of the challenge going forward, I think, to test and reinforce those mechanisms to make sure they're effective when we need them. But I think I'll come back and end on the macro level point. I started with saying, where does Asia fit within US global priorities, and where do security and military uh, issues fit within US objectives with respect to China? And I think that's still a contested area. Uh, if you're a military guy, you say, Given me military missions, I need to be ready to do them, and that means we've got to compete, and we've got to compete to win. And I don't care so much what it does to the rest of the relationship. If you're sitting in the White House or the NSC, you have a lot of other business, or if you're sitting in Zhangnanhai, you have a lot of other business to do with the other side, and you want to keep 
the military and security issues with somewhat contained. You want to manage that competition in an effective way. And I think that's the real challenge for both sides going forward. We have this competition. Can we manage it effectively so we don't have crisis or confrontation? Thank you.